Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Pranzata Podcast. This is your host, Andrea Pranzatelli. I have a virtual guest today. And by the way, this is episode number 89 on this podcast. Today, we have Natty Bumpercar. He is a multi-creative human being. I'm going to let you know in a second all the things he does. He is from New Jersey. He is a stand-up comedian. He is an artist of many kinds. He, he draws, he paints, he writes, he does a lot of things. So I have a lot of questions for him about that. Before we get into it, let me remind you listeners that um, I feel free to chime in on the conversation as we go along. I like to introduce some sometimes controversial topics or philosophical questions. So I enjoy hearing what the listeners have to say in response to that. Um, and don't forget to hit subscribe because it is my mission to grow this channel this year and your support would really help a lot. So let's get right into it. Episode number 89. Um, so Natty Bumpercart, my first question for you is, um, when I was looking over your bio and everything you do, one thing uh -huh. that popped out was that you're a clean comic. Is yeah, that right? That's okay. true. Yeah. yeah. So my question for you, cause I don't meet a lot of clean comics. Um, my question for you is, did you, ch are you naturally a clean comic and that's why this is your style or was, was there a specific reason why did you choose to become a clean comic for a specific reason? Um, I think it's just natural to me. It makes me more like if I ever say a bad word on stage, which I have, and it's fine. I'm totally okay. But it, like, I go, Ugh. like I have a weird aversion to it and always have. And, uh, my ten stuff tends to be more silly and ridiculous and bubbly and upbeat to the sometimes, but it's also sometimes complaining. So I don't know. Yeah, I was curious about that. I was wondering if like there was like a specific choice, like you thought there was a market for it or but it sounds to me like it's if I'm hearing you correctly, it's more just your natural personality. So it works for you. Yeah, I don't know much about markets, but <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard of such things, but I'm not very good at, at those things. But yeah, it's just kind of what comes out of my mouth. Are there um, any particular comedians, um, clean comics that you look up to? I think Nate Bargatze is a clean comic, if I'm not Wrong. I think he is. He's he's wonderful. Yeah. Uh he um I it's funny. I got to go to his special maybe 10 years ago in oh, wow. in, in New York. Wow. Um and uh it was really it was nice and I had connections, not really connections, but I knew people from um uh New York Comedy Club. No, no, Bravo Comedy Club, New York Comedy Club, Greenwich Village Comedy Club, all the same used to be the same owner. Um and it was fun because they were like in the green room. So I got to like be near the green room, not in the uh, green yeah. room, but yeah. near it. Um, but yeah, he's, he's phenomenal. And he's also shares in common with me that he's uh, from the South and, oh. and he still has his accent. I, I got rid of mine. Um, but as far as influences, it's really, I don't know. My brain is kind of a sponge and it goes all over the place. And, you know, I, you know, there's the obvious like Jim Gaffigan. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Fozzie Bear, which is sounds like a joke, but it's also like, I really enjoy Fozzie Bear because he's so uncomfortable and, <laughs> and I kind of really dig that. Um, my boyfriend's really into that. He loves comedians that are intentionally awkward. Like that's actually their comedic style where they're like purposely trying to make the um, audience uncomfortable or like come across as awkward in some kind of way. So there's definitely, um, a, you know, people like that, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the funny thing is I think intentionality is very important there because I do not intentionally do it. Uh, it's just uh, something in my nature that I make, I, I, I end up making things awkward. And I think at some point in life, I was just like, all right, I might as well enjoy this because it seems to be what I do. I, you know, yeah, no, that's, that's great that you can like own that part of your personality. Cause I'm very much the same way. I'm like, I can, you know, I've gotten better with podcasting. Like I've improved my social skills a lot, but, um, in general, I'm a pretty socially awkward person. Like if someone makes eye contact with me for too long, I sort of just like, I don't know how to, like, I'm like, how could people have the confidence to just like stare at another human being's eyes? I'm like me, like what? Yeah. So, why are you doing this to me? Yeah. I, it's, I, I, it's so funny to me, like performers, um, like I love being on stage and yeah. I love talking at people, I guess. 
Yeah. Was when I'm off stage and people and people can come up and they can say the nicest things or they can, you know, say, oh, this was great. Are we really? And I'm just like, ah. and it's not that I don't want to talk to him. It's just one on one conversation has never been my uh, forte, as it were. That's refreshing to hear because when I go to comedy shows, I always have this like internal struggle with myself where I'm like. I'm here to entertain a huge audience of people. Why don't I want to talk to them when they approach me one-on-one? And then like, I start doubting myself. I'm like, maybe this isn't the career for me. Like, what am I doing? If I don't like people on that intimate of a level, why am I even doing this? But it's refreshing to hear that other comedians can relate. Like just because you get on stage, that doesn't necessarily mean you're like this intensely intimate person. It's almost like you get it all out there and then like you need to retreat back into your shell, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. Just what is it called? To process everything. Um, (laughs) In a silly little story when I was, uh, what is it called? Oh, bachelor party. Uh, My friends actually made a shirt because they used to call me Aquardo, which is like awkwardo, but awkwardo. And so they're like, hey, here, you're going to wear this tonight. And I was like, oh, cool. Great. Aquardo. Okay. (laughs) So it's like just something, something inside me, I guess. Innate. Yeah. So it comes natural to you. Okay. So my next question for you, you're the perfect person for me to ask this question to based on introduction I gave that you do so many things. So I can relate to that. I'm also a multi-creative and that's something that's always to a degree like bothered me where I'm like, am I wasting my time by doing all these different things? Should I zone in on a few couple things? So lately I've been kind of changing direction and I've actually been sort of cutting things out to be more focused on less things. Have you ever, since you're also a multi-creative person, have you ever had similar thoughts or is there an argument to be made why doing multiple things is actually good for you? You know, um, well, I think your first your question, I was I was hoping you were going to start at you're the perfect person, but then you kept going, <laughs> which is which is fine. You know, I don't need all that validation. I'm kidding. Um, but so to my mind, and it's like another thing that I've had to like come to um my brain, it does things, right? And sometimes I have a drawing brain. Sometimes I have a writing brain. And for a long time, I would get frustrated or anxious or angry. Would I just like, oh, I have to do this writing thing. But I couldn't do it. Like, like could not do it at all. Or I have to draw this thing for like a commission for somebody. And my brain was like, nope. And it's it was really frustrating and some it, i almost not really but it's like the tides almost like i can't control the water or how it's flowing but i can kind of instead of fighting it i can try to ride with it a little bit gotcha. and so when i don't fight against myself i i find it to be a, a lot easier to just all right this is what i'm doing so now and that's what i'll do is i'll have lists of the things that i need to do almost in preparation for how my brain is going to be. And so, you know, I just have to be comfortable um, to be like, okay, now we're doing this. Okay. Well then here's the things we're doing. Okay. And it's like forcing structure on a little bit of uh, chaos. Okay. So from what I'm getting is that you find there's more productivity for you. If you just don't fight it, you just kind of go with it and sort of plan your schedule around your chaotic diversions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. But then it is also interesting because I've always found that, uh, performing and like doing my podcast and stuff, those are just, and those are there, like, those are just kind of a through line. And so, yeah. and I don't know if you're this way, a lot of, uh, performers and artists that I know are, if if I don't get on stage often enough, or if I miss a week of my podcast, then my brain is just like, what are you doing? You have to go, go, like it all gets kind of bottled up. Yeah. So, so kind of going back to what I was saying before, I personally found that I was doing too many things and there's no, there's no like right or wrong way to live, you know, your creative life. That's why I asked you as like a comparison, but personally I was like, 
man, I'm singing, I'm doing stand up, I'm I'm playing piano, I'm doing stand up comedy, like like I'm doing all these things, I'm doing my podcast. I'm like, how the hell am I going to make this all work and do everything well? You know what I mean? Because yeah. I think I'm naturally like a perfectionist type of person, so I want to do everything great. So I didn't necessarily cut so many of those things out, but I just sort of like narrowed my focus. Like for example, with music, I was like studying classical piano and then singing in multiple bands. I like narrowed it down to just one band as opposed yeah. to multiple bands. And I actually cut out classical playing. And then I just stuck with like more modern genres that I could actually use. So it's not like I quit things per se, but I just kind of like narrowed my focus within those things. Um, but no, back to, I got a little tangent there back to what you said for me, it's definitely the podcast. Like, I feel like no matter how busy I get, for some reason, podcasting is one of my favorite things that I can't see myself getting rid of or taking off of my schedule unless podcasting just becomes unpopular, then yeah. <laughs> I probably won't do it anymore. But as far as I know, it's not really going anywhere anytime soon. There's just so many podcasts out there right now. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think to kind of add to your analogy a little bit of focusing, what I always think of it as is like, having a uh, a library or a bookshelf in my brain. Yeah. And so like for you, it's like, there's the classical music or like, so for me, it's like, okay, I'm writing little books or I'm illustrating little books or whatever. And so like, even if I take stuff off the shelves, the other stuff is still there. Like if, if you ever want to go back to classical, it's still there. You know, it's just like, that's what I figured. Like I'm, I'm starting to realize there's seasons in life for everything. So for example, I started with classical before I started doing more contemporary styles and in hindsight, I'm like, even though I didn't plan to become a classical pianist who that's my main thing, I'm so happy I studied it because it really taught me certain foundations that helped me elevate what I'm doing now. And then like to add on to what you said, I realized when I'm like older and retired or, you know, if I ever retire, like, I don't even know if that's going to be a thing. But when I'm like an older lady and I have more time around the house, it might be something to like get back into. You know what I mean? Like if I'm kind of just at that point, doing it for myself and not for, you know, trying to make a living off of it, I might just kind of be like, hey, let me open some Bach again. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, and the, in my opinion is it's a little bit like, ooh, but like everything in life kind of adds flavor to who you are. Yeah. And so the fact that you studied classical, even if you're not like hard on the classical train track, it's still like there's bits of it there. Yeah. You know? And yeah. like, in comedy, even if people are using similar, uh, like uh, a similar premise to what you're you're doing, um, and people are like, oh, he stole my joke, and it's like, well, it's a very basic premise that they're using, and they're coming at it from a different angle. Yeah, and you know, because I think we all have our different, unless somebody's absolutely stealing, which is horrific, but like that does I happen. Think, itself. I, duh, yeah, but I think you know everyone has their own specific perspective and where they come from, and as long as you're being true to your voice and your experience. I think it's, it's, you know, that's, that's who you are. Right. Oh, without a doubt. There's definitely been um, other comedians that I've seen where I'm just like, damn it. I thought I had an original idea, but it's just, especially in the, the world we live in today, there's just no, it, it, there, there's so many ways for people to get information out there that you start to learn really fast that you're not very special. Like, like whatever idea you have, someone else already has that idea. And if they might get to it sooner than you, if you don't go for it, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. 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 Get it out there. Well, but I think also if they do get to it, you go, you just, you have to, all right, take it in, but then don't be discouraged and, you know, keep doing your thing because, yeah. okay, cool. That's, that's their thing. I'm not going to do exactly what they're doing, but you know, whatever I was born in a small house in rural Georgia. So I'm coming at it from here and uh, kind of, it's weird. I don't know, like being comfortable with your perspective, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I understand um, what you're saying. Okay. My next question for you. So <laughs> this is like random transition, but I did Ooh. notice reading some of the things you sent me. Uh -huh. If I read this correctly, one of the things that is junk food is your um, therapy. Is that did you write that in one of your things? I don't or, know. Did I or was that something? Did I read the wrong thing? May I? I might. That's the thing. Is a lot of times words fall out of me, and I don't really remember. So I don't. I that's it, very, that's 
Is there, it will, I, somewhere I read, unless I was reading your partner's words and not yours, but somewhere I read, I believe in junk food therapy. It's, it's, oh, no, no, that's my partner. Yeah. That's oh, okay. <laughs> now it makes sense. Yeah, that's, uh, so I run uh, kind of a, a show production, I guess, company called Sweet and Sour Comedy and with this friend of mine named Suzanne Stein, and yeah. she's a comedian here in New Jersey. And um, we kind of, I mean, post-pandemic, my comedy world was really rocked, like really shaken, like rooms were gone. Um, producers were gone. Like a lot of the connections were gone. And uh, a person who was very, very, very dear to me who ran a show every Sunday. Um, she was like my comedy mom. Her name is Pat Grillon. She passed away. And like, it was, there was that moment where I, every so often I'll have the, huh, is comedy done with me? You know, like, am I, cause that's, it's, I always feel like, you know, it, it comedy is this amorphous thing. And at some point it's just going to be like cut off and I'll be like, Oh, okay. You're gone. Oh, I liked you, you know, but kind of Suzanne and I started talking and trying to figure out how to work together in book shows. And like, they're, they're not clean. All of them. Like I am, but like, they're kind of more like, I guess, PG 13 ish. So yeah, like, yeah. So, so we can go to like country clubs where we've done schools yeah. or yeah, camps yeah. or what, like all these kind of niches that m people might not be going to, um, and still getting to do shows. But yeah, she's, she's very much into junk food therapy. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a question about it. So I think it's relatable to, relatable to anybody anyways, even if you weren't the person who wrote that. Yeah. So my question for you, because I was under the mindset that you love junk food, but I, I still want to oh, know. Oh, I do. Oh, I do. <laughs> I still want to know either way though. My question was, what if you were on a diet, like uh -huh. trying to lose weight, what would be your junk food that like, if someone offered it to you, you'd be done? Like, okay, I'm not going to refuse this. Like, what's your junk food uh, that has power over you? <laughs> so again, pandemic rough, put on like 20 pounds, didn't like it, uh, larger than I ever was in my life. And um, I actually stopped drinking. Uh, so I am from, I'm from Georgia. And I was telling somebody, I, I growing up, I had Coke in a bottle, like when I was a toddler, uh, mm. drinking it from a baby bottle, a Coke. And so I'm kind of addicted to uh, Coke. Right now I'm on a, a cherry vanilla Coke kick. Um, <laughs> and then my child, basically all he eats is candy. And so I have to take candy away. But now it ends up in my... Uh, you just studio. end up eating it yourself. Yes. It's it's almost like somebody's shot and I'm diving in front of the bullet to save him. Um, but I don't I'm trying to think of like I mean fast food, fried food is what I is what I tend to gravitate towards and it's horrible. And what's it's horrible your what's your go-to fast food? I've gone now, I think Shake Shack is oh, really that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good I one. Yeah, it's, I don't even know if it's fast food. I think they call it fast casual or something yeah, like that. Yeah, casual dining or something like that. Yeah. So you said you you put on weight during the pandemic. Did you lose that weight? Because I mean, I can only see you from here up, but you don't look like particularly heavy to me. So did you drop the weight after? Or? Yeah, I, I guess I dropped like 10 pounds. And then, but I started eating like a lot better and yeah. exercise. Because like, I used to go to the gym every day and then that went away. And um had COVID twice and that kind of messed me up and like, um, but yeah, so I, I, yeah, a lot of it I've, I've lost, but also like I'm re, for, re redoing my house. And so I just do a ton of physical labor. Oh yeah. And, and so I said to my wife, I was just like, I'm, I'm still the same weight. I want to go down. And she's like, and she said, she's like, Oh God, I think you might have muscles. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want muscles. That's not something I, I have or want. So I think, I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, because uh, like I'm just looking, I'm like, oh, you don't look like a guy who gained a bunch of weight, you know? <laughs> um, okay, so next question. This is, okay, I'm throwing, you're the guinea pig for this random thing I'm doing. I'm okay. experimenting with a trivia segment of the podcast. Okay. So transitioning, it's only, it's not, it's just literally one question. Oh, okay. Um, I was getting ready. So the question is, I'm transitioning from the topic of food. I was literally just curious about this the other night. So I looked it up. So I'm curious to see if you can guess. How old is bread? 
When do you think is the like if you were to guess, how old do you think bread would be? How old would bread be? I would guess. Hold on. Uh, what would four thousand five hundred years old? Okay, so bread, the first recorded, and it, and mind you, it's recorded. Like there yeah, could yeah. have possibly been before that, but roughly eight thousand to ten. 8,000 to 10,000 BC was when the oh, first BC. bread. Yeah. So it's like 10 to 12,000 years. Yep. And um, apparently the first evidence of bread was in like Neolithic sites, like um, the Stone Age and stuff like that. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know why, but I was like curious about my, originally I was going to ask you like, what do you think is older potatoes or rice? But when I looked it up, there was no like solid definition. Like I kept finding different um answers oh, wow. on different websites so food history is one of those things that's like no one really knows you know what I yeah. mean? But it was just like interesting to me i'm like huh i wonder like how old rice is how old bread is how how old potatoes are you know that's crazy cool too because like with bread like you got yeah i mean they had to figure out like okay those are grains yeah we're gonna dry them out we're going yeah. to uh, mill them down. Yeah, I, I think they had tools like in the Stone Age. They were using yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, and but then put water. How do in they them. bake them? Like how do they like that's insane. so? I, I, my assumption would be like they would have a a fire with a stone, or uh, I've even seen on some of those travel shows where they'll kind of just put the dough almost into the fire, like on a log, and then it'll kind of cook bake there. So. It's also kinda, fascinating that they even figured that out. Like what, yeah. what made them like, because it, it's like a scientific process, right? To make yeah. bread. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm a cook. I'm not so much a baker, so I don't make a ton of like baked things. Um, but the fact that they even like put the pieces to that together is pretty amazing. You know, you know? it was probably in the last few years, there's been a huge uh, uptick of slime. Like kids love slime and they make slime and it's like made with like, uh, Elmer's glue and uh, I think glycerin and whatever. And so like there's slime. So what I'm, my assumption is there was some kid uh, in, in with these, these people just mixing stuff together and making his parents angry. They were like, stop it with the goop. And then the dad threw it in the fire and then they smell like, That's, wait a minute, that smells good. And then, <laughs> and then the child, they all raised him up over their heads and said, he's saved us. Yay. I, so. I, that's true. Probably a lot of like human creations. I mean, this is all hypothetical, but I agree with you. I feel like a lot of things must have happened just by a happy accident. Like I was thinking the same thing. And the reason I was on the bread thing is because my boyfriend and I, we were talking about this stuff yesterday and we're like, who figured out like how to make recipes, like food recipes. And like, we were like trying to figure that out. And my boyfriend's like theory was like, maybe it was an accident. Like somebody was eating two things at the same time, like taking different bites. And they're like, Hey, this is actually good together. And then maybe that kind of spiraled into like, well, what if we paired this and this? Like, what if we, I wonder yeah. what that process must've been like though, like trying like accidentally eating things that like don't pair together at all. You know? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of trial and error. What was the old, I mean, like, Oh, your chocolate fell on my peanut butter. Your peanut butter fell in my chocolate. I don't remember what there was. That, that was the old commercial, but um, yeah. And yeah, I also have to wonder like how many people um, probably died. Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> where, where, where they're like, Oh wow, we can eat these mushrooms. This is great. And then they, you know, they're like making something. And then one guy goes, Oh, and then you're like, Oh, I guess we couldn't eat that one. I guess. Like even uh, cer certain. Oh, 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 go ahead. I just have to open my door because um, I don't know if you can hear it, but my dog is being quite annoying. So I'm going to he, he likes to come in the room and he's going to bark until you. Yeah. Yeah. She'll, she'll, just sit, she'll sit at the door and she's like a beagle black lab, phenomenally mm -hmm. stubborn. And she'll sit at the door and just bark, bark, bark for like probably 20, 30 minutes. It's funny. I live in a house full of people and they all have their own animals. So I'm so desensitized to like the sound of barking and animals that I didn't even notice it. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> and I can still hear you. So you can still talk. I got this. Um, what was I going to say? I can't remember what we were just saying. We were talking about the history. Oh yeah. We were talking about the history of food. And I was going to say that um, imagine all the people that also died experimenting with what kinds of meat to eat because like certain meat probably carries diseases and stuff like that, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like maybe they saw, I don't know, whatever dead animal that had gone a little bit too much. And they were like, 
that's fine. It's meat. And then not so much. Or okay. I mean, it, it, people kind of, it doesn't make sense that we exist because there's bad stuff in water that you can drink. And it's like, take, yeah, like there's so many things that are here to take us out. So I don't really know how we exist. Also, we're lucky that, you know, we exist in a time where people already made all these mistakes. So we mm -hmm. don't have to deal with them. But then again, it, there's probably mistakes occurring right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, the fun thing about nowadays is the mistakes that we're making are so exponentially much larger that uh, it's not just in infecting or whatever. And that one guy, Tom, who is eating the mushroom, it's now we can uh, impact everyone, which is just. Yeah, no, it's like we're I feel like our era of mistakes is more like we're making mistakes that are going to affect the future. And it's going to affect our psychology, but like not so much mistakes that are at like eating a dead rat or something like that. Like not those kind of mistakes. Yeah. Um, okay. So I do have some philosophical questions for you about mm. art because I know you're obviously very passionate about supporting the arts. My first question for you is how do you, and there's, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for this, but how do you personally define art? Do you draw a line? So for example, my boyfriend and I have different opinions about this. Like, I have a more wide range of things I consider art and he's more like it's got, there's gotta be a line somewhere. Um, do you personally have a definition for what is art is, I mean, is technically any human creation art? Is there like a specific, you know, definition that you hold for what is considered art? Um, so my, here's my background just so it, it will add a little credence or not, or not make, make it less, but I have a bachelor of fine art and painting and a master's of fine art and painting and I founded a uh, a nonprofit um, called the Cedar Grove Artists Alliance. I live in a town called Cedar Grove, and there's no arts. And so I built this nonprofit to kind of promote arts. And um, it kind of came about because someone had painted a mural on the back of their business where no one could really see it. And the town kind of attacked the business and was it was not, not great. And so I was just like, you know, because people are like, that's not art. It's whatever it's, it's, it's garbage. And, uh, it's, it's making our town look bad. And, it, you know, I think there's interesting subtext to that in that the town I live in is a predominantly white town. And when they see graffiti, they go, Oh no. Right. Yep. yep. And so that's, unfortunate to me very um ev even last week very recently uh to the question of art there was a book in um the library the public library called gender queer mm -hmm. and it was on the pride display and some people came in and complained about it and so there's a big big kerfuffle about uh you know this is porn this is smut this is because it's like a graphic memoir of some of uh, of someone's experience, I think, of uh, becoming transgender. I think, and um, so you know, again, when you're talking about lines, like it's these, these interesting, and it's the same kind of thing as the mural where they're like, "Oh no, you know, not people of color or whatever," and this is like, "Oh no, it's a different viewpoint," right? Yeah, and so. That doesn't answer your question, but I was just trying to give you a couple of examples of like how interesting the lines are. Yeah. Um, to me, it depends on kind of where my brain is for the day, how gung-ho I am. But it, like, I could argue that everything is art. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm saying like from cooking to in, in graduate school, I had a, a very big screaming argument with a professor um because we were doing a presentation and a critique and an hour before class i had uh friends of mine i had like a a jumpsuit on and so i had friends of mine come and nail me to the wall like through the suit so that i was kind of up like a few feet up on the wall and so my argument was that everything is art and everything that people do can be art like you can artfully brush your teeth you can art and this isn't to take away from art right but this is just showing that like everything we do like the sheets we uh we're we're, we're sleeping on like 
they were sewn by someone, which is a craft, but that's an offshoot of art. The print yeah, on yeah. the sheet, um, you know, all the food we make, like it's, I think it, it, you know, and people say, oh, if it was made with heart or whatever. Well, what they're saying then is it was kind of made with art because I think it all kind of is. There's an interesting, because I've thought about this before, too. There's an interesting argument to be made there, too, because on one hand, I do agree that anything made with heart and like a loving intention is art. But what about someone who's like an angry artist and like purposely draws a malicious looking painting to express anger or hate? And that's actually the intention. So it's like. I, I, I guess you can say heart doesn't have to be all, all loving. Heart can oh, also yeah. be. So I think, yeah, in the semantics of that, you would say that heart would be considered passion. Yeah. And so then yes. you could have positive passion or negative passion. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good way to put it. You know, but even with that, if someone is, you know, like I think in, in modern art, they really tried to be completely dispassionate and remove the artist's hand from the work um, like that, you know, to try to remove artists from art. But, and so like, that's, what's kind of neat about it is it's so nebulous and there are no goalposts because they're everywhere. But you know, I think in everything in society, it's easy for people. And this is like the art world or people outside the art world to need some sort of structure Yeah, yeah. so that they can go, because I would always like my teachers or even in comedy, they would like, like people in art school would say, well, this isn't art. And I was just like, I'm in graduate school. You let me in. Like you saw my portfolio. I told you what I do. This is what I've been doing now for two decades or whatever. And in, in comedy, same thing. We're all, Go and do shows, and people will say, "Well, you're oh, you're not doing comedy." And I'm like, "That's really what would be the argument that you're not doing comedy because it's clean." Like, I don't understand because I'm not doing setup punch. Uh, oh, yeah. There's and, there's also storytelling. There's different styles of comedy. Yeah, and I tend to be very tangential and very. I try to be present in the moment in the room with that crowd, and so I'm still telling jokes, but I'm bounce. There's a lot of just bouncing around, and um. I think and there's other people that I'm not like the only person in the world, but oh, like, there's, yeah, there's, there's many different styles of comedy. Like yeah. there's some, there's some people who do solely crab work. There's some people who do storytelling, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not just set up punchline. But what it, I think it comes down to is uh, you have this generalized structure that people have come to agree on. And if they see something that's slightly different then the easiest knee jerk reaction is to say, like, that's not, comedy and what they're actually saying is the thing you're doing is different from what i consider to be this thing and yeah. and i'm not going to expand my viewpoint to bring in what you're doing or anyone else because this is what i've been doing i had a couple points to make about going back what you were saying before about the graffiti i specifically remember um something when i was like very young i was like e or nine years old I remember I was driving to Yankee Stadium with some family members um, and we were in the car. And as we were going through, what is it? The Bronx? I don't remember where Yankee, the Bronx. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was graffiti art. And mind you, I was like eight. Um, and it, it there was a, a woman there who was not my aunt, but like my cousin's mom, like some one of those situations. Yeah. It was like a, like a family, like a distant relative, like a, my cousin's mom or something like that. Um, I remember I was like, that looks awesome. It was like some type of graffiti art. And it was, it was beautiful. It was like incredible. It wasn't just like vandalism. Like it was yeah. like very thoughtful, you know, uh, graffiti. And um, the woman, you know, she was, she just responded. And she's like, that's terrible. Like, like, and, and I just remember thinking like, I'm eight or nine. I don't even know what graffiti is. I don't know the politics behind it. I'm just looking at something and recognizing like that looks beautiful. Like, like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a, there's no, it's just, it was just a natural reaction. And she like immediately cut that down. She's like, there's nothing beautiful about that. And I'm thinking like, I don't know. It looks pretty awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's so interesting to me. Like when I'm driving around with my kids who are yeah. 10 and 13 and They'll, you know, if we'll come around a corner and then the, if there's a mural or something, um, they'll just be like, wow, because it just to me visually, you know, you got 
brown buildings, gray buildings, black buildings. Like, but then you see like all these colors and this pattern and whatever. It's just like, oh. Hands out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and no- another incidence like that was specifically with my tattoo artist, the lady who did my sleeve. She um she's from Cranford, New Jersey. I don't know if you're that familiar I, with me. Yeah, I do. I do. My kid, my kid goes to school there. So yeah. Really? Yeah. In, Cran- yeah. in Cranford? Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. Um, so the tattoo artist, there was a sp- and you might even know the story then. There was a specific issue where she was having trouble opening her business because the people in the town were like tattoos are not considered are like the same exact thing like she i mean she, i mean she's incredible like I, like maybe i'll post like a picture oh, wow. later of Is like betty page um it's not it's 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 not anybody it's just kind of like a lady from oh my yeah no yeah that okay. i created um cool. and like told her the idea and she did it but i mean like she her she's an incredible tattoo artist and it, it took her like a good year to convince the town to let her open a business in cranford because there was a lot of people who lived in the town who were like had this, you know, narrative in their head that tattoos were like trashy and for bikers or like whatever they thought about yeah. tattoos, like not realizing that like these days, that's like a very old stereotype. Like I, I think at some point there was like, you know, when, when our parents, you know, my parents were like in high school or college, I think tattoos were for like people in gangs like like that was like people who had like like biker gangs were like the only people who had like the mom tattoo with the heart or whatever but now it's like it's it's so common to have tattoos and like it took her like a really long time to convince them that like no this is a valid business you know what i mean like the townspeople were labeling it like it was a strip club or something like yeah like not in our town yeah we don't want our kids to see that you're like what oh come on relax yeah. yeah, it's funny. Like I have, you can't right now. You can't see them because I have little goops on them. But for my birthday was last week, and I got two tat, one tattoo that I've had for twenty years, kind of brightened up, and then another one that I've had for like twenty five years, I guess, cleaned up, and then I got a new one. And yeah, it's 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 fun. But then I also got I don't know if you can see. There's a little O, and then there's a little E. Oh, wow. I have kids and it's Emerson and Oliver. Oh, that's so cute. And like, she really didn't understand at first. She was like, wait, what? And I was like, I just want very tiny, like, like little letters. And they're on the webbing of my hand. So they're kind of secret. Like you don't always see them because I think that's kind of fun. So I think from what I remember, hand tattoos need to be updated every couple of years, but it's so easy because it's small. But I think like hands are the first place that they wear off or something like that. Oh, yeah. Everyone in the shop, like from the receptionist to a person who was prepping stuff to the artist was just like, we can't guarantee. And I'm like, I'm fine because I kind of I I, I'm super into and I can't think of any of the artists name, but uh, of just kind of temporary art just like how art lives through time right like there was spiral jetty was this was one of the, i think really famous one where a guy in a lake built this um sand and dirt and rock and it was a like a spiral into the water yeah and so like that was the initial art but then the rest of the art was watching it kind of degrade with storms and with water. And so like seeing how nature kind of took it apart was also kind of part of it. Um, Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm kind of intrigued by that kind of stuff too. Um, The impermanence of life and things. Uh, No, you're, you're right. Okay. My next question for you about art. My last question too about art is why do you think art is important? So if, if there was a case to be made, if if one of these people who were like, no, graffiti is not art, were like, art's not important. We don't need it in the community. How would you counter argue that? I would say that art is life. Art is everything. Art is in everything we see and everything we do. It's what creates society. It's what sets us apart from um, our our monkey pals. It's how we communicate it's how we show who we are and what we do and what we love and what we don't love and what we believe in and without it kind of what's the point you know we can yeah yeah no like um the like the aesthetic of my environment makes like it's weird because it sounds 
um, shallow to say that, but it's not like to say like, oh, my the aesthetic of my environment is important to my mental well-being. Oh, it yeah. seems shallow to say out loud, but it's not. Like I love I love having like a nice environment. I like having paintings on my wall. I like having things with a certain like color sequence. You know what I mean? Like that stuff's important to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, and it's funny because you could say, all right, oh, without art, are we all just gonna, you know, live in just white houses with white walls and wear white clothes? But the funny thing is, that is even art- that's an artistic choice, you know, so it's like, no, you're you're right. If I saw that, if I entered somebody's house and that was their personal choice, I would think that was cool. I'd be like, oh, my God, this is so like minimalist. Yeah, minimal. I, I like minimalist choices, too. You know what yeah. I mean? So whatever the choice is, it's an expression. Yeah, it's, it's almost like and I'm just, you know, I'm just speculating here, but it's almost like it's an ex- it's a, it's an outward expression of like the inner mind like the inner world you know yeah i think it's one of the few ways that you can see how like who people are and that's in the choices that they make like the clothes they wear how their hair is if they wear makeup you know like all these things are outward expressions that they've made a decision to do not all you know like sometimes you know kids don't get to make so many decisions but you know but like then the kids are kind of tangents of outward expression of the parents like like, oh, this is how my kids should dress. And so that's what they're wearing. And so, like, all these things are kind of choices. Um, and I think, you know, that goes to, like, not just visual stuff, but how people communicate with each other, how people treat each other, how um, people exist in the world and uh, whatever. If you decide to drive, like, an electric car, or if you decide to drive one of those giant uh, trucks that has the big things that spew the smoke out. Yeah. Like, it's like people are choosing to be seen and expressed as a yeah. certain way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think people who say that they don't think about it or whatever, I think they're being disingenuous. Like um, even even the people who say, because like there's an argument that some people make that they're like the most authentic thing you could do is is to not really dress like any style because you're if you join a particular like so for example if you're like a quote-unquote punk and you wear spikes or whatever whatever you know and you're you like you're like i'm counterculture it's like actually you're oh it's like i hate to tell you but oh you're not but then the people who choose to dress plain it's like there's no way to avoid it you're technically dressing plain to prove that you're the real account of counterculture like no no matter what expression you choose you're there's still a reason or a mentality behind it you know yeah and i think that's why it's it's so hard because it's so easy to be pigeonholed and for people to say oh this is what you but it's it's so hard kind of i think to break out of that because if you're if this is what you're comfortable doing then you just can't care if you're like no i like having leather and think then okay but yeah. you know but then like if they're just wearing like something from the gap or whatever i don't know then that's what they're doing and yeah. you can't you don't want to you don't sneer at them or whatever like let them do them let you do you and yeah you know let everybody be yeah yeah okay i have a few more questions for you so now we're going to transition out of the art questions um okay um t- I never asked my guest this question before, but I was just kind of threw this one in there as a new experiment. Are there any current issues in society that you're passionate about, like that you think are worth fighting for? If not, that's fine too. But I'm just kind of curious about to get to know you as a person for the listeners to get to know you. Is there anything that you're like, if I had to fight one fight, it would be this, you know? Uh yeah, I guess it would, I mean, right now it's kind of censorship and equity and inclusion. Um, and it's, it's, I've, I'm in a strange position in my town where I think growing up, I kind of, you know, I was like, yeah, okay, that stuff. Yeah, I'm for, you know, but I didn't really know what I was talking about. I was young. And now that I have kids, um, I think I've become much more attuned to situations that I didn't know before. And like in my town, there was a board of ed meeting Mm -hmm. and it was in July In June, there were kids from the LGBTQ plus club at the high school who were giving a, a speech at the, at the board of ed meeting. And they were like booed by parents. 
like parents booing children. And um, I saw it and I heard about it and I was just like, ah, ah. Like, I didn't know how as a dad who tries to teach my kids to include everyone, like how I could just sit by and let this happen in our town. And I was like, well, I, you know, stink. Like I can speak well. I know how to speak in front of people. So I wrote this thing and I went in July and I did it. And there was uh, a woman who repeatedly said, uh, um, she's like, all these super duper liberal elitists. And she said it like three times in her five minutes. And I just, I don't know why, but I was tickled by the phrase because it just flowed off her tongue. And so I went up, I was like, hi, I'm Natty Bumper Car. And you have to give your address and everything. And, uh, and I guess I'm a super duper liberal elitist. And then the bad, the worst thing that happened was people started like, kind of laughed. And, you know, as a comic, as soon as I heard that laugh, I was just like, oh, because I hadn't been on stage very much. I was just like, I forgot about this. So then I, I kind of did my speech, but I did a couple of riffs. And at the end I had of the meeting, I had like, I forget, six or seven people sitting yeah. around me, like threatening to beat me up, uh, oh. get out of town. Who the F do you think you are? Like all this crazy stuff. And um, it was very unpleasant, but it kind of, cemented um you know like okay i guess you know people need to speak up um and then now with this kind of book banning thing that we're going through it's kind of very similar and it's just hard as, as far as we i think we live in a world where there are very clear structures that are in place that have been in place for a long time that give certain people more power than other people. And I don't think, and then, so it gives certain people power, not other people, but then the people with more power still point down to the people without the power and say, well, why aren't you doing better? Mm -hmm. it's, it's weird. It's like somebody is drowning and somebody comes and holds their head underwater and then says, "Why? It's your fault. You're drowning. What are you doing? Get out of the water!" While while actively like having their hand on their head. And yeah, the, the, I think the older I get, and with the kids and stuff, it's become really something that I that worries me and bothers me, and that I think about a lot more than I ever thought I would. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting when they said liberal elitist. Where does the elitist part come? Because after talking to you, I can definitely see you're liberal, but I don't know where the elitist. Like, I'm not like this guy's full of it. Like he's 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 narcissistic. Like that never crossed my mind. Like so, I'm wondering is that just a stereotype that they have? Like they like like where does that come from? I think my understanding is that there are organizations who put out because if you if you take the time and listen to a lot of these different things in different places like the book burnings or people upset about who can use what bathroom or whatever um then you'll start to hear phrases that are used over and over again almost like it's scripted or like they've been given talking points um and it's always very interesting because they'll come in and they're super passionate. And they, I, here's this zinger of a phrase. And you're like, mm -hmm. it's almost like if you're at an open mic or something and somebody's like, ah, and you're like, you didn't write that. Like it's, that's actually, so you, wait a minute. Like it's, you know, and so it's, it's just, I think you have to come to the real, realization that these people have um, a perspective and it's very important to them but also that maybe the amount of passion and anger and rage that they have is being fueled by stuff that's intentionally stoking that anger. Mm -hmm. So it's and like, in a way, it's like you almost can't blame. I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's like a whole nother conversation. But to yeah. a degree, it's like you almost can't blame people for feeling a certain way because they're being fed yeah. information. But see, but then that takes out their um kind of them as people and so it's it's it becomes very hard and and that's kind of why like if you're getting into an argument with someone on the computer 
it can get very visceral and very mean very quickly. If you're doing it in a group, kind of the same thing, group mentality, mom mentality, feeding off of each other. And then if you can just sit down and because I went through this with it, I, I intentionally talked to some of the people individually. And at least in that meeting, they were like, all right, you're not, you're not so bad. Like, yeah. Whatever. So it's like, it's almost like you're right. It, it, I was, it's funny. You kind of answered the question I was going to ask. I'm like, I would never expect somebody to online. I could see it because they have that shield of not having their face seen, but I'm surprised these people are coming to you in person so aggressively, but then you just pointed out that it's the mob mentality where it's like, they have that shield of not just being them. But yeah. when you confront somebody one-on-one, like who could ever go up to somebody? I mean, I guess somebody could, but who could ever go up to a person to their face and be like, you're an elitist, like, you know yeah. what I mean? With that, without like getting to know the person or talking to them first, you know? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And like the elitist thing, I think is such a uh, a funny word because they like the. I guess from what I've figured out, the elitists are people on the East Coast and then the West Coast, uh, which are kind of I guess more liberal, who uh, went to college and uh, yeah. and so that's and that's elite. And you know, you could argue that yeah, I think you know if people had the opportunity to go to college there that is like more opportunity than a lot of people have had so i can you know you can start to it's an interesting argument because you can start to kind of follow the thread to see how they got to it but if i'm like i came i had a single mother like we were we grew up poor i had to get grants and everything i'm crazy in debt from going to school so yeah, me too. How, how how am I how am I elitist exactly? Like I was yeah. when, when I moved to New York, my financial aid fell through and I was homeless for 3 months. So tell me again how I was elitist. Like I it's, you know, it's it's I think it's just easy easier to take these big brush strokes and throw them at people uh because if it's a big brush stroke, chances are at least a couple of specks of paint are going to land on the people. And then you can go, see, you have red on your face. And you're like, uh, well, yeah. you threw, you threw a can of paint at me. So yeah. Okay. You got, you know, but it's, uh, it's life is interesting. Kind of to like tag on a little bit what you said about the student loan debt. My answer to my question that I asked you, I would be passionate about fighting for student loan debt because that's like a whole nother thing. I'm also in like debt from going to school, way too much debt for like the degrees I have because I have a I have two degrees. I have one in um, for music. And mm-hmm. one for Spanish. I literally, I literally tell that to people on stage as one of my bits, and they just start laughing at that. Like, just like, that. They're, like, they're, yeah. like I'm just like, yeah. So I, I'm in debt for having two degrees in in Spanish and music, and they're just like, ha, ha, like they're just like, yeah. you idiot, like what's wrong with you? Um, yeah. But um, no, like that's definitely because I feel like there's a lot of weird stuff going on there too, where they're like willing to give like the the expensive price of college first of all and then the yeah. fact that they're willing to give out loans to people that are not their brains aren't developed yet like you can give a loan to a 19 year old 20 year old kid yeah. um to make a quick decision to get to school because they think that's what they're supposed to do and yeah. and um you know you can even trace it back to like there was never a conversation in college about student loan debt and like the severity yeah. of it and like what like i never knew that you can't write it off in bankruptcy if you have an injury or something like that like there's nothing you could do to get rid of it you know it's like there's so many issues there with the student loan debt that that's probably like where my like anger my societal anger comes in with yeah that. well i mean to your point when you know from when we were growing up, you were supposed to go through school, go to college, uh, get a house with a white picket. Like the American dream has been like drummed in like this is this is the path you're supposed to follow, but with no real guidance on how to get there. And not that there's one direct path, but, you know, to your point, I think I wish in high school that there was a class that was just like, okay, you know, like you, you know, like, here's some of the realistic things that you're going to face. You're, you want to go to college. Okay. Well, you're going to have to take out loans. This is how loans work. And this is how the interest works because I think it's very predatory what they do. They, it's almost like a bringer show yeah. where they're like, Hey, you, you want to, you want to go to college or you want to be a comedian? 
cool, 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 cool. So what you're going to have to do is get $25,000 in loans or 25 people in. And you're like, okay, I can do that. And you know, then you don't have friends anymore or you're very much in debt. Like, it's just like they have people in a position where they know what you want. And then here's what they're going to extract from you to, to, for you to get to that thing. Yeah. It's just like, and it is a really complex issue too, because it's like, um, I, I've heard some counter arguments from, you know, more financially conservative people. And I say financially conservative people because some of these people aren't necessarily conservative just with the finances they are. Yeah. I've heard some counter arguments like, okay, if we eliminate student loan debt, well, then who pays for it? Because it doesn't just disappear. Like some someone has to do something with it. Like, mm-hmm. what do we do? And And I don't know. My argument is like, I feel like it's... Yes, like you should pay for debt that you took out. But at the same time, there should be I don't understand why there's not an allowance to file bankruptcy in severe situations. Because like, if a if a billionaire can open a company that fails, and he can file bankruptcy for that, why can't there be certain conditions in which a child whether let's say they took out a degree and now they can't do it because they had an injury that makes it so that they can't use that degree or mm-hmm. they have something serious in their life that prevents them from getting that job or they took out a degree in a job and they've genuinely tried for years and years to apply for this job and for whatever reason there's no more jobs available for that i feel like there's certain things where it's like okay this was a plan i plan to pay this back it failed I can't do this now. Like, like I, I don't understand like why or why can't there be like where they cut off the interest? Like, like, like there's, yeah. like, you know I mean, like, it's like, I'm willing to compromise here, but it's so strict. Like it's, it's, it's so incredibly strict, you know? So that's, that's the interest is what really kills me because what I would do is for 20 years, I would make my payments and every month I would see my principal might go up. Yeah. Like I'm making, I was paying between fourteen and sixteen hundred dollars a month, That's great. and like, which is crippling, right? And trying to have a family and whatever, like, you, it's just you can't. I mean, you can, but it's it's very difficult. And you'd make these payments, and then you'd look at the, and you'd be like, huh, how did I go up? another $300, right? And it just keeps on ballooning because the higher the number goes, the more the interest is, the higher it goes. And so you're, it's, it's just, you're stuck and it becomes almost like uh, an indentured servitude type thing where you're just like, well, you made the choice to go to school. Okay. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Like, well, no, only the people who can afford it should really go like, what? That's huh. Um, And then, you know, you see like when, banking crises happen or uh, the housing crisis and you see these massive corporations that are too big to fail that are bailed Mm -hmm. out right Mm -hmm. but then people who have student loans that's that's the argument i'm making is like i'm not saying that everybody's student loan should magically disappear if you're making the money to pay for it pay for it absolutely you took out those loans if you're making uh if you're a doctor and you're making a lot of money you can pay for that Absolutely. But like it, that's what I'm saying is like, it seems unfair that certain billionaire companies, they can file a bankruptcy for failing, but an individual who can barely buy a loaf of bread that week can't get assistance. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's where I draw the line where I'm like, okay, like there's something's not right here. Yeah. It's a rigged system, I think. And, And there's also weird things too, where it's like, so technically any loan that is backed by the backed by the government can't be um, forgiven um, through bankruptcy, but private loans can be. But even people who took out private loans from private companies, somehow there's some loophole in the paperwork where they say it's backed by the government. Like so, there's like certain companies that uh. offer student loans that they're like, well, technically, if you look in this, you know, the document here, it is a government loan. I'm like, I thought this was a private loan. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's there's something going on, you know? Yeah. You're like, does not compute. Does not. Yeah. 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 But anyways. Yeah. Okay. So we're, I usually go for about an hour. So we're almost reaching the tail end of this podcast. Oh, phenomenal. So I'm going to ask you just one more question. All right. Um, Okay, so let's end on a positive note here because I, there's I don't want to end on like what's is society doomed like you know what I mean I don't want to um, <laughs> yes I'm just kidding okay so <laughs> when you personally find yourself heading in a downward spiral spiral in life like because I'm convinced that everybody has phases where they oh, yeah. aren't doing well 
what is something that personally works for you to get you back on track? Like what inspires you to get back? Like meditation? Like what's your thing? I go get a Manny Petty uh, <laughs> because they're the best things on the planet. And it's like an hour that I can be by myself and um, just close my eyes and uh, get my feet massaged. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. I don't, any guy who doesn't get Manny Petties, you're missing out um, because you just sit in a chair that's massaging you. You put your feet in warm water and you get, it's just so nice. My it's problem so- is I bring my phone with me. So I feel like I don't fully enjoy the experience because I'm like texting people and doing work emails. Yeah. So like, I feel like the next time I go, it can be pricey. So I feel like the next time I go, well, first of all, I only do petty because I'm a piano player and um, oh yeah, any Manny, b- believe it or not, you would be really surprised. Even just a thin coat of clear nail polish affects my piano playing. Really? I'm not it- sure. I, I really don't know why. I'm not sure, but I could, I swear to God, I could feel the difference. I don't know if it's, it's like slippery and I could feel my fingers yeah. slipping. So I don't fuck with nail stuff. I just cut my nails as short as possible. I file them down. But yep. when it comes to my toes, like that's, that's where I go all out there. Like uh, yeah. design, sparkles, everything. I do the gel and it adds up. So I'm like, I really should like not bring my phone with me or put it on like, uh, what not private airplane or whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Do not disturb. Do not whatever. disturb. So yeah. I can like fully enjoy the experience because yeah. I'm, I'm a weirdo. I don't know. I, I'm much. Yeah. I, I, I really prefer, I usually only get the petty, uh, but since it was my birthday, I, I, I started getting Manny's like maybe a year and a half, two years ago, but it's because I was having, I guess, I don't know if I was having a lot of anxiety, but I was biting my nails constantly and it was gross and i hated it and so then i and when i would do it without even thinking and i was just like come on what are you doing and, I'm like, eh. and we're in a pandemic what are you doing and uh but then if i paint the nails then i don't bite them and they're so too like, pretty and you spent money on them well also because it tastes horrific uh so and it was your when's your birthday you said it was your birthday Seven Eleven. really Mm -hmm. wow it's a good birthday it's yeah no those are like all lucky numbers (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right so we're gonna end it there um i will include your information if you want me to i will include your information in the thing below for your instagram if anybody likes what you had to say and they want to hear more of you or learn more about you again everybody this was the pranzata podcast episode number 89 it was a pleasure having him today for the podcast i had a great conversation you know it was interesting to get to know you and hear your perspective um if you enjoyed what you guys heard today don't forget to comment in the comment section to chime in on some of the things we talked about and do not forget to hit subscribe to help me grow this channel this year and that's it Pranzata podcast episode number 89. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.